Good morning, church family. It's so good to see you. Would you bow with me in prayer? Well, Father, you are in heaven, and we are on earth. So we shall make our words few. Thank you for the wonderful, merciful Savior. We are expectant to hear from you by the comforting, helping, encouraging Holy Spirit. We ask you to speak now to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are at last finishing the book of Nehemiah. We're in chapter 13, and it is a doozy. It's a wonderful, wonderful passage. The last chapter of Nehemiah is best captured by Winston Churchill, who said, never give up, never, never, never give up. The book ends with desperate confidence. Nehemiah prays, remember me, O oh my God. Desperation for God, confidence in God, Nehemiah pleads, O oh God, I am rotten. I beg you to remember the three things that by your grace I managed to get right. Remember, O oh God, that I loved your house, that I loved your day, and that I loved your people, that I did not mistake your house for our house, that I did not mistake your day for our day, and that I did not mistake your people for our people. We would be wise to follow in his footsteps. Verse 1 Point one, remember, oh my God, I did not make your house our house. Verses 1 to 14. On that day, day, they read from the book of Moses and the hearing of the people, and there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So when they heard the law, they separated all foreigners from Israel. Here's Reformation. Reformation and revival have been a theme through the book of Nehemiah. And here we find again Reformation. What is Reformation? Open the cage, let the line of God's word out. God's word will do everything. And that's what we find here. The lion that day was specifically Deuteronomy 23. Judah hears the word of God. Judah obeys the word of God. That is reformation. We are reforming our lives, our thinking, our attitudes, our feelings, our behaviors, our church, back to the word of God. James 1.22 warns us that knowing doctrine... Just knowing doctrine means nothing at all. Demons know more doctrine than we do and yet never reform. We must know doctrine, believe doctrine, love doctrine because doctrine's revealing God. Doctrine's revealing our God and we want to be conformed by him into his image. Now there are many fools who will say here in this chapter, that scripture is racist. How dare they put out people because of their ethnicity? Well, that's not what's happening. You would have to ignore the fact that Ruth, the Moabitess, was the great-grandmother of King David. You'd have to also ignore the fact that Zelek, the Ammonite, was one of David's faithful mighty men. This is not an expunging of ethnicities from Israel. This is expelling those who refuse to forsake their pagan gods and their pagan ways and who chose to remain Moabite, who chose to remain Ammonite and who did not, like Ruth, say, your God is now my God, your people is now my people. They refuse to repent, they refuse to bow and so that day Judah obeyed God and separated all all of the unrepentant foreigners from the midst. 
Now, who does that include? Public enemy number one, Tobiah, the Ammonite. This is no coincidence. Nehemiah explains in verses four to five. Now, prior to this, he's given the backstory. This is why it's significant. Prior to this, Eliashib, the priest, who was put in charge over the chambers of the house of God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him in the temple, where, formerly, they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, also new wine and oil commanded for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. The priests, the Levites there that served in the temple, they lived off people. The people would pay tithe, and they would live off it so they could give their lives to the ministry of worship at God's house, to the ministry of God's people. And Eliashib, a priest himself, removes all their provisions and moves in Tobiah because Tobiah is his family. We've seen many churches in history go kerplunk because people started politically moving in their family instead of those that were faithful. When you start prioritizing your family over worship of God, over the people of God, bad things happen. The priest is acting like the temple, God's house, King Yahweh's palace is his own personal home. And Eliashib foreshadows that false prophet that's going to emerge from Israel who's going to make a way for the Gentile beast or antichrist who sits enthroned in God's temple as king and God, such blasphemy. This is serious. Now, we might be wondering, and we would be wise to wonder, where in the world is Nehemiah at this time? How is this happening? Glad you asked. Verse 6. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king. You remember that Israel is, is being ruled by an empire, and that Nehemiah had been sent from the emperor, from the king of kings in this empire, to go and restore Jerusalem. But he had to go back. Why? Well, haven't you remembered? Chapter 2, verse 6. You are memorizing this book as we go, right? The king said to me, Nehemiah said, before he left for Judah, the king said to me, the queen also was sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a date. He told him when he was going to return. Chapter 5, verse 14 tells us how long it is. I was put in command to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Ar King Artaxerxes for 12 years. Hey, I need 12 years. 12 years are up. Nehemiah goes back to visit the king to give a report and actually to live there for what we think is 8 to 13 years. That's amazing. It's a, a decade, give or take a couple years. When this whole thing started, Nehemiah was about 40 years old. He was in Judah for 10 years, 12 years, excuse me. He goes back to the king in the capital for 8 to 13 years. So, so we think that Nehemiah by this time is about 60 to 65 years old. Okay? He's retiring age. Verses 7 8. After some time, that is the, the 8 to 13 years, however, I asked leave from the king. The king had loved his trustworthy cupbearer. He loves him even more now that he's proven to be a great governor in one of his main provinces. But more importantly, God loves his faithful servant who refuses to retire into obscurity. Retirement can be a wonderful thing if you do not retire from the work of the Lord. If you give your life your most valuable years, when you know the Lord most, when you are most equipped for the work of ministry, use those years. Nehemiah did. 
And he says, I came to Jerusalem and discerned the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by preparing a chamber for him in the courts of the house of God. It was very evil to me. Chapter 6 has told us that Tobiah had married himself and his son into powerful positions. He has bought the nobles of Ju Judah. He's got them in his pocket. He's controlling the masses. It seems like every other day, Nehemiah is receiving an intimidating letter from this scoundrel. He's a well-connected, very powerful politician. He's not only sneaking stuff into the temple, he's making his dwelling place there. I discerned the evil, says Nehemiah. I, I, I studied it. I watched it. I've trained myself to distinguish what God's word says is good and what he says is evil. And this was very evil to me. You see, brothers and sisters, what is evil to God must be very evil to us. As the world is saying, good, evil. And evil, good. We say, no. Nehemiah says, no, that is evil to my God, and therefore, it's very evil to me. Therefore, James 4 says, to one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him, it is sin. Nehemiah saw, this is wrong. For him to wait back and say, Lord, I really pray that you provide someone to take care of this. He would have been in sin. We don't wait and pray when things are clearly wrong. We act to the extent that we can. We act like our king, Jesus, who was devoured by zeal for worship. God's place needs God's people worshiping their God. And nothing interferes with that. We're told that zeal for God's house consume him, ate him alive. You would have felt that Jesus was on fire because love for God breeds discernment of evil. My friends, listen, if you've grown numb, unresponsive, cold, callous, desensitized to the evil we see in the world, you can safely conclude your love of God has grown cold. Because with love of God comes discernment of evil. They rise and they fall together. Verse 9. Then I said the word, and they cleansed the chambers, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. Why? Because it's not enough to hate what God hates if you do not love what God loves. It's not enough to just banish Tobiah. Men with a filthy temper can get angry about things that the Bible prohibits and they can go mistreat people in the name of Christ. Westboro Baptist. But faith in Christ, love for God, results in love for what God loves. And so Nehemiah doesn't just throw out Tobiah's stuff. Nehemiah brings back the things of God. You remember what Jesus had to say to a church that was really good at hating what he hated, the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2. Listen, he says, I know what you've done. I know what you've suffered for my name's sake. I know that you can't even tolerate sin or bad doctrine. You're really great at that. But you've left your first love. You hate what God hates. You don't love what God loves. God forbid that we become a place like that. God, become, God forbid we become people like that. Verse 10. I also came to know that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his own field. Judah has stopped tithing. Tithe was commanded under the Sinai law, the law of Moses. Judah has stopped doing that. And so the priests who are responsible for the spiritual welfare of the nation, they have to run back home and start farming again. And Friends, listen, it is not a stretch to say that is a very good illustration of why God wants our spiritual leaders, we, wants pastors freed up full-time to give themselves to the work of ministry. We need that. 
It's not uncommon to hear people romanticize, no, you know, pastors should have their own job and do the work of ministry. Yeah, if they want to die at 20 years old. But we want pastors that live long and could give themselves completely focused on praying for the church, serving the church, preaching and teaching in the church, equipping the saints for the work of ministry, praying for the church, comforting the church, counseling the church. This is good in the sight of God. We see it here. But Judah had stopped. Judah had stopped that. Verse 11. So I contended against the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? That he contended with them becomes a theme. He is fighting with the leaders of Israel. They fought him. He fought back. He doesn't have to fight them if they say, you know what, Nehemiah? Good word. We messed up. We're going to change. No fights happened in that case. But fights are happening, which means they resist him. They fight him. He fought back. And do you notice here that Nehemiah is a single issue leader? He's not troubled over Tobiah's personality or Eliashib's policies. There is one issue and it drives the wedge between him and the officials. And it is this, how Eliashib and Tobiah view and treat the house of God. How they view and treat the worship of God. That is the issue. My friends, we live in a very simple time as citizens of this secular nation. What is their view of God's people, of worship of God, of God's house? That's it. That makes it very simple. And it made it very simple for Nehemiah that day. They do not love God. They do not love God's house. They do not love God's people. They do not love worship of God. Then I gathered them together and had them stand in their posts. You remember that chapter 10 records how their covenant, they cut a covenant. They made a covenant to protect God's house, to protect the Sabbath, to not marry unrepentant Gentiles. And they've already broke it. It's only been a decade. And they've already shattered it. Widespread. You know, Jesus commands his leaders to love the flock. To not lord it over the flock. But the gentleness that he commands us grows a little bit louder if his people are wallowing in lack of clarity. The voice has to get louder. The word has to be more boldly preached when people lack clarity. If there's mist in the pulpit, there's fog in the pew. It's good, huh? I got that from someone somewhere. I think that one was a Scott Artavanis one. Verses 12 to 13. All Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, new wine, and oil into the storehouses. Good response? Praise God. Reformation. Correction. Response. Clarity breeds integrity. In charge of the storehouses, I appointed Shelemiah the priest. Zadok the scribe, and Padiah of the Levites. In addition to them was Hanan, the son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted as faithful. You don't put men in leadership and hope they're faithful. You identify the men who are faithful doing what they're doing, and you make them leaders. And it was their task to apportion everything to their relatives, to their brothers in Israel, is the lit literal language. Faithfulness replaces unfaithfulness. And if you notice, Nehemiah, and, and I believe that Nehemiah is godly on this note, that there are a lot of second chances for the people at large. But when it comes to leaders and positions of leadership, boy, those second chances grow much more slim. And there are a lot of churches out there that parade the fact that they're giving their leaders a bunch of chances to morally fail and yet remain in their position of leadership because we're all about grace and God says, uh-uh. 
How can you expect my people to live rightly if all they see are examples of, shucks, I'll try better next time. There's a higher standard here. Verse 14, remember me, Nehemiah prays. Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out my loving kindnesses which I have shown for the house of my God and its responsibilities. Don't you love his humility? You might naturally read this chapter of scripture and not see Nehemiah as humble. How dare he say, remember me for this? Did you read what Nehemiah said? Do not blot out my loving kindnesses. Why? They're imperfect. I've got love for your house and its responsibilities, but it's imperfect love. I've done acts of love for your house, but they're imperfect acts of love. Would you please not blot them out? Please remember that, that, that I've loved your house. I've messed up in a, in a million ways, but I've kept the plain things, the main things, and the main things, the plain things. And can we say the same, church? Can you, individually, can I, say that worship... Proper worship of God is our highest ambition, our highest responsibility, or does our time, our money, and our family and efforts reveal something different? Second point, and they get shorter as we go. Remember, oh my God, I did not make your day our day. Verses 15 to 22. In those days I saw in Judah some who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys, as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. And they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. What is this concern now? We've went from God's house to what? The Sabbath, God's day. Now, is Nehemiah speaking legalism or is he speaking love? We need to dig in a little bit to appreciate what's happening here. They are wasting wholesale. They are wasting God's special day on themselves as they love and trust money more than God who provides for his people. Verse 15, so I testified against them on the day they sold food. Notice that Nehemiah, godly leadership, godly parents, do not wait until something becomes a trend in order to address it. Well, let's just wait. Let's just see if it becomes a habit. Let's just just see if it becomes a pattern. False. No. Wrong. Not good. Nehemiah says, I saw it once and I stopped it in its tracks. That's where we nip it in the bud. The Sabbath proves that God provides. And here the nation is false advertising about God. And how does their sin affect and impact the surrounding nations? Verse 16, also men of Tyre were living there and brought in fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them, here it is, to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. You can hear, you can hear Nehemiah. The fact that they're doing this, the fact that you have such close fellowship with unbelievers in this way already, uh, it's, 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 it's dodgy. But you're doing this on the Sabbath. You're breaking the law to do it with him. And you're doing it in the king's city. You see, worship reveals God. How we worship reveals God. God's told us how to worship him. And so when we worship him the way he said he's, he's to be worshipped, we reveal God to a lost and dying world. And the Sabbath was instituted under the law of Moses, reminding Israel that Yahweh had saved them from slavery in Egypt all by himself. They had to do nothing. And so take a rest on the seventh day, do nothing. And remember, you do absolutely nothing in your salvation. I'm the God of salvation. I save by myself. He doesn't need the Sabbath. God is not needy for attention like the demon gods. They need the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, Jesus said. By the way, the new covenant completely eradicates the old covenant. 
We are no longer under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Messiah, during which every day is our Sabbath Sabbath rest in Christ. He is our Sabbath rest. Every day is a day of worship, but we gather together for corporate worship as he's commanded, not because it's the Sabbath, but because we love gathering on the day that the Lord rose in order to carry out the one and others that were commanded in Scripture. We're not celebrating the Sabbath today. We celebrate the Sabbath every day. And we long to enter that final rest in Christ. Verses 17 to 18. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing you are doing, even profaning the Sabbath day? Did not our fathers do the same? So our God brought on us and on this city all this calamity, the great exile. We were banished from the land. The, the Jerusalem was destroyed. Yet you are now adding to his anger on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. That's why he sent us out. Nehemiah's hitting it where it hurts. He's going to the leadership. He's confronting the nobles. Is Nehemiah conflict hungry? Does he just like a good fight? He's 60 to 65 years old. I have a sneaking suspicion that he avoids fights as much as possible. But it must be done. You are doing what provoked our insanely patient God to expel our ancestors from the land. While our loving God is smilingly saying, rest, 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 remember me. You are putting a gun in his unwilling hand and you are pulling the trigger for him. Romans 2. Do you not know that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? I'm curious, brother, sister. Is there a sin you continue to live in? Are you still living in sin? Because the reality is, for the new people of God under the new covenant, they're dead to sin. They no longer live as a way of life, as a way of joy giving life. They never live in sin. It's horror to them. It's filthy to them. Yes, we still commit it, but we're disgusted at it when we do. It's no longer our life-giving relationship. Verses 19 to 21 of Nehemiah 13. Now it happened that just as it grew dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, so this is the evening before the Sabbath, so when the Sabbath actually begins is sundown the previous day. I said the word, and the doors were shut. Then I said that they should not open them until after the Sabbath. Then I had some of my young men stand at the gates so that no load would enter on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the traders and merchants of every kind of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem. They're, they're like shoppers before Black Friday. They're, they're camping out in their tents before the doors open. Nehemiah says, then I warned them and it said to them, why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I will send forth my hand against you. Now, you might read that and say, that sounds so Old Testament, Sam. Really? What does Paul say in Romans 13 and Galatians 5? Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its desires. What is the one sin, the one temptation that you find is very strong and you make provision for it? You say, well, I'll just drop, drive by that place or I'll walk by that person or I'll just stroll by that thing. That's making provision for the flesh to act. Make no provision for it. And I say, walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. 
See, it's not just avoiding. Walk by the Spirit. Live in the Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Meditate on the Lord. Look to Jesus, and you will be transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Your appetites will be roused for the desires of the Spirit rather than the desires of the flesh. From that time on, verses 21 to 22, they did not come on the Sabbath. That's good leadership. That's really good leader. He's helping them. And I said to the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and come as gatekeepers to keep the Sabbath day holy. Let's keep the Sabbath day protected in Jerusalem. This is great leadership. Leadership doesn't just act, that's what Nehemiah does, but he gets everyone else coming. Hey, help your brothers and sisters. Levites, come on, get right with God and stand here with me and let's protect the ones we love from sinning against God. It brings them no joy and it puts them in grave danger. Verse 22, for this also remember me, O my God. I equipped the saints for the work of ministry. I protected your day. I did not treat your day as our day. And... Have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness. Do you hear again the humility? Perfect people need no compassion. Only sinners need compassion. Only failures need compassion. Only imperfect people like you and I need compassion. And so Nehemiah is not self-confident. Nehemiah is God-confident. Please do not remember my sins, my many sins. Please, please, please. Remember my victories, though they are few. Forget my sins. Remember my victories that I did by your grace. Forget all the rest. Forget all that's of me. And pity me for my failures. How do you and I pray like this? Do we ask God to show compassion according to our great effort? We do our best. He forgives the rest. Is that how we do it? Nope. That's how world religions do it. That's how every other religion, that's how every religion in the world does it. The gospel is entirely different. How do we pray, dear brother or sister in Christ? Do we pray according to our great effort? No. He prays according to the greatness of your loving kindness. An infinite loving kindness. God punished our sin to the full extent of the law in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Bottom line, and so we pray to the fullest extent of God's love, which is Psalm 103 says, is higher than the highest heavens. He does not deal with us according to our sins, And he does not reward us according to our iniquities. He dealt with Christ according to our sins. He has dealt with Christ according to our iniquities. So that for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness to those who fear him. You struggling? Have you failed lately? How many times did you fail this morning on the way to church? Oh, am I the only one? And do I pray, Lord, be compassionate? You see how hard I've tried. No, I say be compassionate to the degree that you are infinitely loving. And that's what we, that's what we bank on God. We don't bet on ourselves. We go all in in Christ there. He bled for me. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Wretched, miserable sinner. Wonderful, merciful Savior. No confidence here. All confidence there. And this will change us. How can we deny such love? Lastly, remember that I did not make your people our people. Verses 23 to 31. In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. As for their children, half spoke in the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but only the tongue of his own people. How long has Nehemiah been gone? Eight to 13 years. And in that time, many men have married unrepentant pagan women and have brought up their children without any knowledge of Hebrew whatsoever. 
Just one decade and an entire generation speaks no Hebrew. No Hebrew, no scripture, no scripture, no knowledge of God, no knowledge of God, no worship of God. One generation, one generation can paganize the entire nation. Verse 25. So I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God. It sounds like a scene from a spaghetti western. So I called Nehemiah John Wayne Nehemiah in the first service, but Rick Wood was gracious to remind me that John Wayne was not in spaghetti westerns. That was Clint Eastwood. So Clint Eastwood Nehemiah fights because they fight. They're guilty. They fight. They're cursed if they do not repent. Nehemiah is not perfect, friends. Even the best of men are men at best. Nehemiah is not perfect, but Nehemiah is right. He's right. And what does he make them swear in the name of Yahweh? Verse 25, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take up their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. He's quoting Deuteronomy 7 and Exodus 34. He's quoting the word of God to them. He's not cussing them out. They swore and signed an oath in chapter 10. I quote, everyone old enough to understand are entering into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given them by the hand of Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to do all the commandments of Yahweh, our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. And here it is. And we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. They signed on the dotted line. They swore to that. And yet Nehemiah woos them. Yeah, he got in a fight with some of them because they wanted a fight. By the way, what a stud. 60 to 65 years old. He's throwing up fists with these guys. But his default position we see in verse 6, 26. He's wanting to woo their hearts. He's wanting to woo them by the word of God. He says, did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations there was no king like him. And he was loved by his God. And God gave him to be king over all Israel. Nevertheless, we know how the story goes. The foreign women caused even him to sin. You can imagine Nehemiah sitting there going, we are a tiny company in a tiny little city with a tiny little wall. Do you think that you're stronger than Solomon at the peak of the monarchy? You're playing a dangerous game. You're playing a losing game. You're playing the same damned game as Solomon. What are you doing the deceitfulness of sin. Satan sells us a peach and steals paradise. Verse 27. Do we then hear about you that you have done all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Now, if you are one of those men living in sin, the faithful love of Nehemiah sounds an awful lot like embarrassing shame. But my friends, the problem's not with Nehemiah. It's with them. He's loving them. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. If you are not liking counsel you're receiving because you're living in sin, I ask you to turn from your sin to the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. And what is actually faithful love will begin to sound like faithful love to your ears. But until you turn, it's just going to sound like criticism and shame. But that problem is yours. Nehemiah didn't want to hurt them, but God's love made him willing to do so. And we must be willing to do so if we love people. And we see a wonderful response. They must have repented because none of them are banished. Well, except one. Verse 28. And even one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanbalat, the Haronite. So I made him flee away from me. No one else. God's people have been regained, it seems. But this one young man, the grandson 
of Elishib would rather have his pagan wife and all his hair and his cheeks unbruised yet forfeit his soul. Sanballat the villain, Elishib the fake, he raised hypocrites who raised hypocrites who married pagans. Verses 29 to 30, Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. This last little bit was one of the few times that I shed tears while preparing this sermon. And it might strike you as odd as I read. Thus, I cleansed them from everything foreign and ensured that the responsibility stood for the priests and the Levites, each in his own work. And I arranged for the supply of wood at fixed times and for the first fruits. And you might say, why in the world did that draw tears to your eyes? What's the final thing we ever see Nehemiah do? The next thing. It's just the next thing. He did the next thing that he saw as being fit for the glory of God and the good of his people. And he just kept doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the reason it drew tears to my eyes is because I thought of you. I thought of you and you're having heartache in marriage or in parenting. Perhaps some of you are lonely, struggling with joy battling sin, all of us. Perhaps depression has turned to despair because you think it's not going to end. It's not going to change. What did Nehemiah do? The next thing. He did the next thing that he knows the Lord wants him to do. Should Christ return, he will find us doing the next thing. And if he waits, we shall die doing the next thing. And as I read the final words of Nehemiah in this book, at least, it reminded me of the final words of a few of my heroes. Thomas Goodwin, on his deathbed, last said, Christ cannot love me better than he does. I think I cannot love Christ better than I do. I am swallowed up in God. Now I shall be ever with the Lord. Cotton Mather, dying, asked, Is this dying? Is this all? Is this what I feared when I prayed so hard against a hard death? Oh, I can bear this. I can bear this. John Calvin resembles Nehemiah when he says on his deathbed, I have lived amidst extraordinary struggles here. I am nothing, yet I know that I have prevented many problems that would have otherwise occurred. I have faithfully attempted what I believe to be for the glory of God. And Nehemiah closes his book, Remember me, O my God, for good. Father, We do ask that you would remember us, O God, who only remembers, the eternal God, who only has memory, not as if it's past, but you know all things, and so you only have to remember. Remember us. Make us men and women who love proper worship of you, who love giving glory to you on this special day, who love your people. Remember the few things that we get right by your grace and forget all the rest and the wonderful, merciful Savior's blood. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.